Hi, everyone. Please take your seats. I'm Naomi Firestone Teeter, and I'd like to welcome you here tonight on behalf of the Jewish Book Council. A Grand Debut is the first program in Jewish Book Council's new literary series, Unpacking the Book, Jewish Writers in Conversation, hosted in this wonderful venue, the Jewish Museum. Jewish Book Council is a not-for-profit dedicated to promoting the reading, writing, and publishing of books of Jewish interest. Find out more at jewishbookcouncil.org, or you can pick up our rack card on your way out tonight for a list of JVC programs, awards, and publications. It's right outside the door. And you can also find a sheet with book club questions for all of the books here tonight. Before we begin tonight's program, I'd like to first ask that you silence or shut down your cell phones. And most importantly, I'd like to thank, give a special thanks to our sponsors for all their support. The Burke Foundation, the Jewish Museum, specifically Colin, Samuel, Ronya, and Will, the National Book Foundation, Electric Literature, and Tablet Magazine, an online publication committed to Jewish writing, publishing both original Jewish fiction and reviews of new novels and books. And thank you especially to JBC staff, Carolyn Hessel, Mary Pomerantz-Dauber, Nat Bernstein, Carol Kaufman, and Mimi Frank for all their hard work to make, help make tonight's event possible. They're in the back. <laughs> Please note the following change to our program tonight. Unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, Molly Antipole was unable to travel to New York for this evening's event. We will keep you informed about future JVC programs with Molly later this spring. Although we miss her today, we're extremely excited to welcome our other two panelists here, Daniel Torday and Alexis Landau, who both have debut novels coming out this March. Following this evening's program, we welcome you to join us for a book sale, author signing, and reception, and reception. During the reception, we encourage you to visit the Jewish Museum exhibit, Helena Rubinstein, Beauty is Power, which can be found on the first floor. And join in for a guided tour of the exhibit at 8 p.m. downstairs. The gallery and reception are yours to enjoy until 9. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our series moderator, Bear Barry Weiss, right over here. <laughs> Barry, is associate book Barry is an associate book review editor at the Wall Street Journal. Before joining the book review, she worked as an op-ed editor of the journal and continues to write regular profiles and op-eds for the page. For two years, Barry was a senior editor at Tablet Magazine, where she edited the site's political and news coverage. She has also written for Haaretz, The Forward, and The New York Sun. Be sure to look for Barry on New York One, where she talks about new books she likes on a segment called The Book Reader. And I'd personally like to thank Barry for all of her help putting the series together. I'm sure throughout this evening you'll agree the conversations are much better when she's a part of them. Thank you so much and enjoy the evening. And if you are a JBC Circle member who did not receive your books, please find me at some point after the program and I will get them to you. Enjoy. Thank you, Naomi, and thank you guys all so much for coming. I am very aware of how freezing it is outside and that there was a sign for falling ice outside of this building, so I know you really trekked to make it. Um, before I introduce the very good-looking and very talented uh, ink-stained wretches to my left, I wanted to note, uh, in case you missed it, that there are cards on all of your chairs. After we talk for about 45 minutes, you guys will be able to ask questions. And the way that we're going to do that is that Jewish Book Council staff will come around and collect them. So if anyone doesn't have one of those cards, you can raise your hand and someone will come around and give you one. OK, guys, I'm pumped to be here. And the first person that I'm going to introduce is Daniel Torday. And I want to hold up his book so you can all see the lovely cover. This is his debut novel called The Last Flight of Poxel West and it's gonna be published next month by St. Martin's Press. It's received early praise from all sorts of bold-faced names, including George Saunders and Karen Russell. Torday's novella, The Sensualist, won the 2012 National Jewish Book Award for debut fiction, and he currently serves as the, as the Director of Creative Writing at Bryn Mawr College. Please join me in welcoming Daniel. Thank you. To my left is Alexis Landau. She recently completed her PhD in literature and creative writing at the University of Southern California, where she teaches writing. Her first novel, The Empire of the Senses, is due out in March from Pantheon. 
Amy Bender has called this book lush, smart, sexy, and beautifully researched. Indeed. Originally from Los Angeles, she lives there now with her husband and two children. Please join me in welcoming Alexis. Thanks. So because most people here haven't read your fantastic novels because they're not actually published yet, um, here's a chance for you guys to practice for Terry Gross or Charlie Rose. Tell us, perhaps starting with you, Daniel, what's your book about? Okay, great question. Uh, first of all, can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay, I can hear you too. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, well, thank you so much for that introduction and Naomi for the introduction. Uh, and I also just wanted to say briefly first, thank you so much to Hilary Rubin Tiemann, my editor, who is here and uh, who made this book what it is. So it's really amazing to have all these people in one room. Can you still hear me? Uh, so uh, this book uh, has two separate narrative threads. The, the first uh, takes place in sort of contemporary Boston. It's 1986, so I think that's not quite historical fiction yet, 1986. Um, and it's told by a teenager named Eli uh, whose uncle Poxel uh, has just published a memoir of his time during World War II. Um, the memoir is complicated. It's about his having left his home north of Prague right before the beginning of World War II uh, at his father's behest. And then by way of Rotterdam, ending up in London, uh, where he trains for and then flies for the Royal Air Force, uh, flying bombers that drop bombs on uh, Nazi Germany. Um, I think it's a sort of little known and more known in the last decade fact that uh, during the last two years of the war, of World War II, uh, Allied bombers from uh, Canada Britain and the United States uh, leveled 130 German cities, killing over 200,000 civilians. Um, Germans essentially didn't talk about this fact for a very long time. It wasn't in, really until uh, 1997, 1998, when a writer named W.G. Zabald, who you guys might have read, um, started giving a lecture called On the Natural History of Destruction, in which he was essentially the first uh, German scholar to start to just sort of talking about these issues. Anyway, the second half of the narrative is, is told by Poxel West. It is his memoir. Uh, it's called Skylock the memoir of a Jewish RAF bomber. Uh, so it alternates in these two voices throughout the book. Uh, uh, Poxel is a Shakespeare scholar, so it's in five acts. Um, and they play out uh, over the course of his life during the war from 1939 to 1947. And then Eli's uh, narrative about both the publication of Poxel's memoir and then some problematic aspects of the memoir that come later. Uh, I should say I have gotten coaching both to not reveal spoilers and also to reveal spoilers. I am interested in. Uh, having do you guys, do you guys having know what read happens? the book, you should not reveal the. I'm spoilers. not going to reveal the spoilers. We can talk about Game of Thrones later, <laughs> and I could just like do red. I could just say Red Wedding, and then um, there are issues uh, surrounding que very interesting questions to me of. Um, veracity in the memoir, and ones that I think have been pretty specific, both to the time when Eli was around, and then also to the time um, when memoirs about the Jews in the war took place, too. So that was my way too long-winded version. How'd I do? Good. Alexis? Hi. Um, well, my book is essentially starts in 1914 when World War I um, breaks out in Berlin, um, and it traces the history of a family, um, a Jewish uh, patriarch married to a Gentile wife and their two children. Um, and then he goes off to fight on the Eastern Front, and it is told from his perspective, the first part one of the book. And um, he falls in love with a Jewish woman on in um, this small town called Mita, which is um, actually about 20 kilometers from um, Riga, right? Well, that's where it's located, actually. Um, and then he returns, and part one ends, and then we skip ahead about nine years, uh, opens in 1927, and we see his children, who are now grown, I think they're 20 and 18, um, a boy and a girl, and they are going in very different directions. Um, his daughter is experiencing all the, you know, frivolity and beauty of Berlin at that time, and um, actually ends up falling in love with a Jewish man who wants to emigrate to Palestine, um, and his wife, their marriage is disintegrating and they're becoming more distant, and his son um, denies his Jewish 
heritage or the Jewish side of his um, ancestry and joins the brown shirts um, and becomes part of that early national socialist movement. Um, so it's about tracing this family's history and their, how their past choices inform their present um, when the novel you know, is in the second half. Um, and it's about all of the brewing forces that led up to the Holocaust, but it is not about the Holocaust. It's really about what it was like to be um, an assimilated intellectual Jewish you know, family in Berlin and how unimaginable the future was to them at that point. There was actually a line in The Last Flight of Poxel West that made me think of your book, Alexis, and I wanted to read it to all of you and then have you reflect on it. Um, there's a point where the narrator, the is it Eli or Ellie? Eli Goldstein, this, this uh, young Jewish man in the 80s um, who's now grown up, is explaining uh, to the reader why he got his PhD in 19th century European history. And he says this, I've always had a hard time answering why that period was the one I settled on. Maybe I've known all along. There's a comfort in living with the period before all the tumult that Poxa lived through. 1848 wasn't 1944. It was a period of wars and revolutions and upheaval, but distant enough to be history and stay history. It had no living survivors. Alexis, I'm wondering if that passage resonates for you. There aren't a lot of novels about, at least that I know of, about Jews during this interwar period, and I'm wondering why this uh, specific time appealed to you so much. Well, yeah, I actually underlined that <laughs> line in your novel um, because it has a lot of similarities in terms of why I wanted to focus on the time period, um, the late 20s, essentially. And it is because it was such a distilled, sort of untouched time in a way in terms of Jewish identity and the things that were happening then. Um, there was a lot of tumult, but it was a lot of positive tumult in some ways um, in terms of you know, the kind of promise or dream of assimilation seemed like it was coming true, but at the same time, there were these darker undercurrents that people were not you know, fully aware of or thought it was just on the fringes. Um, and it was definitely just a really interesting time that in some ways it was a tipping point and it seemed like history could have gone either way. So I kind of wanted to capture it right before <laughs> it exploded. Have you thought about the fact, uh, lots of political commentators, and that's the world I'm coming from, have compared the period that we're in right now, uh, especially for the Jews, to the 30s and to this kind of late 20s period where lots of people were blind to the, the political brew that was the poisonous brew that they were kind of stewing in. Have you thought about that in connection to your book, the period that we're in right now? I definitely have thought about it, um, but I think it is really different as well um, because Jews are even more assimilated now, um, and there's a sense, especially after the Holocaust, of you know it not happening again, and that we have you know imagined and known the unimaginable. So there is that knowledge, um, and I just think that I don't, I don't, I'm not sure entirely, but I don't think a lot of Jews are just so willing to now, you know, pick up and move to Palestine or Israel or you know those kinds of flights, um, but it is a frightening time as well, so uh, I'm not entirely sure what to expect. Danielle, how about you? Why World War II and the Royal Air Force and Boston in the 80s? That's more imaginable to me, but can you talk a little bit about why this period appealed to you? Yeah, I mean, one thing I wanted to just say out loud as you guys were starting your part of that conversation is uh, very pointedly, and I hope not in a fetishizing way, but the word Holocaust doesn't appear in this book, and it doesn't appear in the promotional materials for the book, and I look forward to seeing whether or not it'll appear in the responses to the book. Um, but, but I feel as if, you know, I, uh, I wanted to sort of say, like, well, well how can we, um, are there ways in which that big capital H word could get in the way of some of 
the of our ability to think about some very specific things that happened from 1939 to 1945 so that we can think about them in a fresh way. Um, so it, I mean, it seems a lot like that's what Alexis is after in her book, right? Is just saying like, well, what if we look at that moment before um, and look at it clearly? Um, for me, some of it was just following some sort of family history stuff. Uh, Alexis, you've actually talked really eloquently about the fact that this is not a family history, but something that you're able to take on fresh. No, it's absolutely no family history. But I was actually wondering about your book and how much of it is or isn't. Yeah, I mean, look, I should say I'm not a historian. I'm not a genealogist, and I'm a novelist. So I'm always interested in trying to just say, how can this thing be as plastic and as malleable as possible? Um, but the background behind writing this book was that my grandparents had, had come from Budapest in 1954. My father was born just after the war in 1947, and they came to Long Island. Um, and I sort of knew their background and, and had done some fictionalizing of it in my first book, The, the Essentialist. And so I sort of wanted to move past that. So I spent a couple of summers traveling across uh, Eastern Europe to seeing family and, and one uh, cousin, in, my grandmother's first cousin in particular, who um, as family legend had it, had flown for the Royal, trained for the Royal Air Force and, um, and had left his home north, north of Prague in Leitmeritz, the small city about 60 kilometers north, and then ended up in Rotterdam and then ended up in, in London. So, so I sort of wanted to trace that. So I spent a couple of, of months on two separate summers uh, sort of retracing the steps that he had made just to, to get a physical sense of the space and then talking with him. Um, where, the, where the truth of that, uh, where the fact of that ends, sorry, not the truth, there's lots of truth, where the fact of that ends is that he actually was injured, he, he ended up down in Rhodesia, which is now um, Zimbabwe training um, for the Royal Air Force and was injured and was not able to fly anymore, so he ended up working for British Royal Airways. But it did open up this sort of, um, you know, I don't like the phrase counter history much, just because, like, why is it a counter history? Because it's not the history that we've been telling. Uh, there's this history of um, of a lot of Eastern European uh, expatriates and a lot of Eastern European, Euro Eastern European Jews, and a lot, I don't know if I can quantify, who did fight in the war effort in Britain um, in lots of different ways. Um, and if it's interesting to you all, I could maybe bring up some examples of, of people who I sort of uncovered, but um, there was a whole Czech wing in the Royal Air Force and that started in 1943. Um, there was a Polish wing. Some of them might have been Jews, some of them weren't. Um, but there was this sense that uh, there was a version of what was happening to the Jewish population in, in Eastern Europe during that period that I had heard a lot as a kid. And then all of a sudden there was this other version of it that felt very different to me. And I wanted to find out like, well, what would it look like to make a fictional but also accurate version of that? Are there, is there still family in Zimbabwe? I'm just curious. They didn't end up in Zimbabwe. So actually, so Hansa North, who was the sort of first of a number of models for, the, for Poxel, uh, Hansa's brother actually was named Poxel. Uh, it's, it's a nickname for Leopold. He was actually taken to Trace and it was killed in Auschwitz. So there's a certain personal irony to having you ended up using that name. Uh, to go from sad to not sad, I just liked that X and thought it would look good on the front cover of a book. Like, there's a big X there. I, I, sorry, have you heard of the name Poxel before? Yeah. I'd never heard that before. So but I just, it was useful when you did break it down and in the actual book as well. Yeah, so the, the way it was explained, the sophistry of it, that like doesn't make any sense, but this is how it was explained to me, is uh, Leopold, Leopox, Leopox, Poxel. Or just As like, someone okay, that like, likes abbreviations, it makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> I mean, you could easily just be like, ba 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 dang a dang dang a poxel. Uh, so, um, and then there were a number of other cousins who who were sort of made the similar treks. My father had, my grandmother had another series of cousins who, um, or group of cousins who were in Vienna, and they also ended up in London in 1941, living in a group home together. And they actually now live in the island of Dominica, which is down near Turks and Caicos. And I've gone down there a couple times to talk with them about their experience. Um, yeah, it was awful. <laughs> I guess I'll go to this island to talk about war. Um, and, um, you know, and in the midst of all that, I sort of uncovered a lot of these family stories of people who had similar, uh, part of the thing with the diaspora is that there's the sort of the, the version of it you've heard a lot, and then there's these other versions. And so I think I, I felt like, um, as I was finding these versions of things that just sounded so different from anything I'd ever heard, I wanted to try to track them down um, and, then, and then make fiction out of it. There's so many places in your book, Alexis, and hearing about the research that you did and the travel, I'm wondering, you know, what was that like for you and do you kind of go through a similar journey? Um, yeah, well, I will address that, but I just wanted to say one other thing about your book, which I really loved, was the idea of how do I tell this story in a different way? And one of the 
kind of less told stories in terms of your hero was in, in some ways about vengeance or to a certain extent as opposed to victimhood and it was really refreshing to read that. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, and you were asking... And the vengeance in the book kind of, just to pick up on that, <laughs> it's coming from the victim. You know, it's like that is... Yeah, I mean, maybe you want to speak to that a little more. Well, I mean, I think that is some of my sense of survival guilt. I mean, uh, he, he's not with us anymore, and, and I don't think that uh, wherever he is, he would be embarrassed for me to say it, but, you know, the, the big conflict that my grandfather had, um, he grew up in a small city north of, of uh, Budapest called Jinjush. If there's any Hungarians in the room, I probably just said that miserably. But um, but he his whole family w w was liquidated at the end of the war, and, and he was sent to a labor camp um, in northern Hungary. And, um, you know, one of the things that he did was, was he loaded bombs onto Axis planes, onto essentially Luftwaffe planes, Hungarian planes that were flying with the Luftwaffe, right? So he was a Jew whose job in a labor camp, not a death camp, was to load the bombs onto planes that would then be dropped, for instance, like on London during the Blitz, right? So in a way, like his survivor guilt was a question of vengeance or victimhood or sort of where you sit in all that. He was the guy who like, Help push the bomb onto the plane that dropped on the people, and then maybe in like Coventry, some people died, right? So, I guess what I would say is like, and I want to be really careful in how I say it because I do not want to sound at all glib or flippant about it, but um, I think there was a, a period during which it was useful, important, necessary, and probably the only way to think about these histories to say there were victims and there were perpetrators. But the idea that there weren't also victims who were perpetrating violence during that period, it was war, right? And these were, this was part of what was happening. Uh, during, from 1941 till the end of the war, during the day, um, the Brits were flying sorties, sorry, during the day the Americans were flying sorties and during the night the Brits were flying sorties essentially without uh, end until the end of the war. Um, so I, I make no moral or ethical claims about that, I just say that's not a thing I knew about. So when, it, when the time comes to try to make a fiction out of it, how can I imagine a human who could have existed, who might have been a part of whatever that interaction was about, and what the sort of complicated aspects of it were? I'll also just say, and I'm talking too much, so just stop me at some point. So like in the middle, this book took eight years to write, because I tried to write a version of it and realized I had no idea what I was talking about. So then I had to like put it down and do like five years of homework. Um, and I didn't want to. I, I'd be interested to hear, Alexis, your book is like incredibly well researched, so I'd be interested to hear how much of that you wanted to do. I did not want to do any of the research I did, but it just became the case that I had to. But in the middle of all of that, this Quentin Tarantino movie, Inglorious Bastards, came out. And I had that moment of just like, all right, I guess I gotta find my next project. <laughs> but then I saw it, and there was this way in which it's like, well, you can imagine this sort of like, uh, you know, dream of vengeance against like, you know, what if you just sprayed bullets into Hitler's face? Or you could like find out that like, uh, there was a there were a lot of um, Germans being killed during the war. So like, does that really need to be like a dream of vengeance, or is that just sort of one part of what actually was happening during that war? And also, just to add one more thing about that, is your version of vengeance? And I'm not giving away anything because you already said it, but um, was just the in some ways his guilt too about how much destruction he was causing for you know for instance Hamburg and what that felt like and I thought that was really well handled just it wasn't black and black or white or you know definitely in the gray so, thank you yeah that was <laughs> let's hear about a little bit about the research they did for the book and the travel um well unlike uh Daniel I loved the research <laughs> probably went a little overboard maybe um but I was actually terrified of starting and having that feeling of not having enough to draw on and feel convinced myself that I knew what I was talking about. Um, so I did spend a lot of time, maybe two years, just reading um, memoirs, looking at a lot of photographs. That really helped um, because the photographs gave me the images and the images gave me the scenes. Um, and I just needed to have that level of detail in my brain before writing at least a certain amount. Um, and then I started, and it would also go in stages. So for instance, um, at a certain point it, when I had to write about the beginnings of Jews coming to Palestine, then you know I had to stop and read on, about that and then go back and write. So it, it was a stop and go process, but at a certain point when I got going and I knew specifically what I needed to research, like the occult in Berlin, 
in the late 20s and what a seance would be like, I could read a chapter of a book and the kinds of objects or things that they needed to use and how it would, in general, go. <laughs> of course, there's no set way a seance goes. but um, And that would just give me the spark to write that block. Um, but I really did feel I had to do a lot of homework before I could even start. And it was very daunting for a long time. And actually, even during, I had a lot of moments where I thought, this is insane, <laughs> um, but let's try to keep going. So, <laughs> you know, I was I was thinking about when reading your book, and also because of the title, which I want to talk a little bit about. There's been this kind of explosion in what's being called sensory history. You know, ways of of writing about, let's say, the Civil War, but from the perspective of the five senses, is a way of making it come alive to us today. And your book is just very sensual. You know, it's very kind of textured and. Um, you, the images that were coming to mind, for me at least, and I don't know that much about this period, were really powerful. And I'm wondering, um, you know, to what extent that, you know, maybe that was informed by this visual research you did, and if you could talk a little bit about the, the title of the book. Um, yeah, well, that is really interesting that you say that because that was how, that was my way into the history, was understanding it through the senses, but, um, one of the things that I was very worried about when I started wanting to write this book was thinking about these big abstract concepts like, you know, the rise of fascism or, you know, assimilation and its discontents or all of these big ideas and then knowing that what would people really care about is the characters and their struggles and the flesh and blood underneath those big faceless ideas in some ways. Um, and so I think that because I had that anxiety that I would get too caught up in you know, the concepts that I needed to ground them with the bodily, everything about you know, touch, smell, the texture, um, and also working with Amy Bender, who is very much about the small moments being just as important as the big, grand, sweeping, if not more important than those moments to ground, you know, really ground the story and the characters. So I think that also was a reason why I thought, you know, a glance can be just as important as World War II or, you know, World War I starting. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. so anyway. And I kind of find that, I mean, when, when you describe both of these books, you know, they sound epic and they're about, you know, these really crucial uh, historical moments, but they're actually, like, you both are romantics. These books are also love stories, I think, to a large extent, and um, I'm wondering if you can kind of speak to that, if you think about these books as, as being love stories. Well, I definitely thought of your book as <laughs> unrequited love, um, even though there is some aspects of it being requited, but there is a, a sense of it sort of unfulfilled, and I, that is very much a similar theme without trying to give anything away either um, in my book, and I, yeah, yeah I think that Everyone, most people love to love, you know, love stories, so. Uh, yeah, it's tough. Uh, um, so, like, I teach these creative writing workshops down at Primark College, so I think a lot about, like, talking with, with uh, apprentice writers or young writers about these questions. And, um, like, one question that always comes up is just, like, so how do you handle the version of the story that you start telling? Um, there's a cur this great Kurt Vonnegut Paris review interview where an interviewer which actually is just him asking himself questions. Uh, <laughs> says, like, how come you never write about love? And he says, well, because as soon as you put love on the page, then that's all your reader cares about for the rest of the story. And so, uh, you know, in some ways, uh, back to sort of like the version of the book that I might want to make to the version of the book that it became. I mean, I'm not sure that I wanted there to be a love story at the center, but once there was one, then you follow it in this sort of like, you know, Cherche la Femme thing. Um, how can you not follow that if your character has fallen in love? Um, and, and you know, in a way to sort of like turn the corner back to the question that you guys are asking about research in the senses, um, I love in his most famous of his uh, famous uh, introductions to his novels, Joseph Conrad, who, who was 
Polish, so Eastern European, not Jewish, uh, says, my job as a fiction writer is to make you see, to appeal to the visual world as accurately as possible, and that is everything and that is all. And I think he means it pretty literally. Um, and then like Flannery O'Connor kind of like extends that out to saying like the five senses. She says, you know, if you, if you don't appeal to at least three of the five sentences in any given paragraph, you're probably not showing your reader much of what they need. Um, and that's really hard when you're thinking about 1921 or you're thinking about 1944. Like, I, I would go to Rotterdam, um, and, you know, I don't know if you've been to Rotterdam, but, but, like, so Amsterdam, they basically tried to just completely rebuild Amsterdam after it was bombed during the war. So there's, um, like, in Dresden or in Amsterdam, there's, like, whole churches where they actually went through brick by brick and just rebuilt them to spec. Rotterdam, they decided, we will just have the weirdest architecture in the history of anywhere. No buildings will be rebuilt even close to the way that they looked. So if you go to that city, there's these, like, you know, there's a building that kind of looks like this weird lever with a clock on the end of it. It is this strange. But so to go back to that city and try to imagine, well, what did it look like in 1940? because in one night at the very beginning of the war, Rotterdam was bombed. 50% of its buildings were destroyed in one night by the Luftwaffe. And in fact, famously, um, a, a treaty was signed by the Queen, and they said to Hitler, like, don't bomb us. And then apparently the telegram just didn't get through. So they're like, well, there goes half your buildings. Uh, so going back there, that's not funny. But so going back there and trying to see what that looks like is like a pretty massive um, attempt to just use the imagination. There's no way that that doesn't become fiction. But like, there's one neighborhood called Delftoven where you can go and, and most of the buildings kind of look the way they did. And in fact, that neighborhood is, is uh, the, it's the pier from which most of the pilgrims left to come to Plymouth Rock. So it also has wow. some interesting, um, like it was half of the pilgrims sort of left from there first to come to, uh, to here. What, are, what was I supposed to be talking about? You're doing um, great. You're doing great. One thing that I would say in terms of that research is, you know, I think for me, I never exactly want to just go back to, like, what do I know about love as much as, like, where can I find some stories that feel accurate and then in telling about those sensory experiences, have them come across. So, like, there's a... Um, there's like a big part in the, in the last 20 pages of this book where, where one of the main characters has been in the, in the midst of the blitz, has, has been blinded by um, a bomb falling on her house. And I had I actually, I think probably like you were describing, Alexis tried not to go for sort of like big published memoirs, but tried to find a lot of self-published memoirs that weren't terribly well written, but that had a lot of like sensory details. And when I say I didn't love the research, like it's hard to read through a 400 page novel, sorry, a 400 page memoir about the war that, it, that wasn't published by a publisher, wasn't published by a publisher for a reason, right? A, a book that like anyone on the planet would want to read, but, but in some, for some reason wasn't told in a way that could make anyone on the planet read it is hard to read. But I would find these just kind of telling details. So like there was a detail of this woman who said that after her house was hit in the Blitz, um, for a period she, she couldn't figure out why the wall had jumped up and hit her in the face and why she couldn't push herself off of the wall. And it just stuck with me as this moment of just saying like, yes, in that, like, in that moment of trauma, and in that disoriented moment, that's what that felt like to her. She didn't realize that she was down on the ground and had shards of glass in her face and that she was never going to see again. But she just kept trying to figure out. And in fact, like, there's the sixth sense of proprioception, right? She could no longer sense where she was in relationship to her spatial relationship in the world. And that felt like, OK, so like, if you were in love with that person and they told you that story, like, now I can comprehend what it would mean to respond to that. Right, I can't really think like what would it mean to lose the woman you fell in love with during World War II. Like that is not something that I can conceptually understand. But I could say like, well, here's this immediate sensory experience, and what would it look like to just sort of put that on the page? Um, and then all of a sudden, research feels malleable. Yeah, I would just also add that, like you were saying, it's the details is what you know grounds it and makes it possible for me to to conceptually then write a scene about that as opposed to saying I'm going to write about you know losing the love of my life in World War II you know that's just impossible so the way in is always those small details one of the characters in your book that felt the most um, three-dimensional and not even three-dimensional just alive like I see her in my head right now is I don't know if it's Leah or Leah Leah, or Leah, or, yeah. or Leah, either yeah. way. They both, they both um, work. <laughs> who is, so two, two kind of uh, notes of background, which is that the patriarch uh, that Alexis mentioned in the book is this guy, Lev Perlmutter. He gets sent to the Eastern Front uh, in the war, and he ends up fall. I don't think I'm giving too much away, ends up falling kind of madly in love with this religious, Russian, uh, illiterate, very kind of earthy, Jewish woman and, and the wife that he's kind of left back at home is sophisticated, elegant, Christian, uh, very much of the 
Berlin world. Um, and then you see that pattern happen again where Lev's daughter, Vicky, who's been raised, you know, essentially as a Christian in Berlin, falls for the same type. And the question this raises for me or that it, it got me thinking about is, um, can we escape our Jewishness? Because it, it's kind of, you're making an argument a little bit with those stories that Jewishness is somehow like in our marrow and bone deep. And even if we try and assimilate kind of all the way, which is what definitely what Lev at least thought he wanted to do, he was kind of drawn back into this, this world of his past, or of his ancestors, I guess you could say. Um, yes, I mean, I think there is that argument um, implicitly running through in terms of more like what happens when you try to deny your roots or repress them or not acknowledge them. And a lot of times, or what I was trying to show is that it can sometimes backfire and come upon you in a very unexpected way where perhaps with Lev, he's very attracted to this woman and falls in love with her, not just because of who she is, but because of what he is repressing or not you know, being conscious of in terms of um, the different aspects of himself and his own history. And so a lot of times, you know, if there is a lack in somebody or something that they're not acknowledging, it can then be embodied by someone else. Um, and in some ways, she filled that void for him um, at that point. Um, but then, you know, it gets more complicated. <laughs> Thanks for not give anything away. What void does Poxel fill for, for Eli Goldstein in this book? Ooh, good question. Uh, I mean, some of it, I think, is just exactly what you guys are talking about, which is, um, like, in the end, I'm just ultimately more like a book nerd than I am a history nerd. And like, I, when I think about the books that I love to read, they all take up this question we're asking. You know, I mean, I like love William Faulkner, and I love to read Sound and the Fury and Absalom, Absalom, and they're just these books about how whatever um, the sort of like um, local magnate trying to build buy a build a bu bunch of buildings up is doing is still in some ways influenced by something that was happening in Haiti in 1890. Or I love Marilyn Robinson's housekeeping, in which we just have the sense that like a grandfather dying in a lake and then a mother committing suicide in the same lake somehow just pushes forward. Like that trauma will take generations to be undone, if ever. Um, so for me, in some way, you know, I think this this Eli character just has this need to. Um, sort of less understand the version of, of, the, of World War II that he's been told than just sort of like understand what his family's version of it was. Um, and you know, and some of that's always gonna be a little autobiographical. Um, I think I'm willing to say on stage in a place called the Jewish Museum uh, that I, my, both of my grandparents in Hungary during the war converted. Um, my grandmother died on Long Island in the early 90s without ever in the United States admitting that she was Jewish. Uh, my grandfather admitted that he was Jewish after she died. In fact, at her uh, after her funeral, he like brought out a bunch of papers that included, you know, his like Juden book from uh, from being a Mozart Jew, and um, and then was very interested in his Judaism afterwards. Um, Were you raised they, Jewish? Uh, so that's complicated. Uh, my mother is Jewish, and my father had an, an aunt who had come over in the late twenties and, and bought a huge apartment on um, in the nineties in Riverside Drive. Um, and so he would come up here on weekends, and she would say things like, want to go to Zabar's? And then like, he was and like, why do you knew. like this lock so much? <laughs> so I mean, so he, he really did, he did come to understand that, that he was Jewish in a very clear way. Um, but he also had no, no Jewish education. So like, his, his parents were going to midnight mass, like even when I was a kid, for, from their home in Wanta, in a little kind of uh, Hungarian shtetl. And then he was bar mitzvah the year before I was. So we actually studied Hebrew together. Um, and then he had his bar mitzvah, and, and, and his parents didn't come to his bar mitzvah, but they did come to mine. <laughs> um, and I guess all I would say is like, uh, and, I, and I mean this, and it's a stupid and facile and ridiculous thing to say in front of you all, and let me, t let me t have a timeout for a second. So I keep on thinking about, like, I'm not Philip Roth, and you're not Ralph Ellison, but there was this time right after Goodbye Columbus came out where Philip Roth and Ralph, Ralph Ellison had this big famous event at the new school where after Goodbye Columbus came out, in which there was this very famous story in which uh, there was a Jewish soldier who sort of like tried to skirt all of his, um, uh, all of his duties as a soldier. Do you guys know this story? Anyway, there were, there were rabbis who literally shouted him from the audience, like, why are you a self-hating Jew? And like, it like turned into this whole like almost fist fight. So, so you're Ralph Ellison, yes? 
Ralph yeah, Ellison. Yes, she is. Um, so, so if anybody gets like real mad at me and wants to shout after I say stuff, feel free to. But I just feel like I need to be honest, right? Um, lay it down. To, to lay it down, which is to say, like, I mean, there is some part of me right now that's just has my grandmother's fear in me. They're like, oh my God, I am actually sitting on a stage in a place called the Jewish Museum admitting that I'm Jewish in front of humans. Like one day, something really bad will come of this, right? I mean, and, and I'm not, I can intellectualize that and I can make a joke about it, but like there's, so, and you know, and again, back to the book nerd part of me, like David um, Grossman's See Under Love is one of my favorite books and that's what that book's about, right? It's the 1960s and 1970s and it's in Israel and there's just this sense of these survivors who just aren't able to, um, to move out of whatever that mode they were in during that period. And I guess all I wanna say is like, I'm not that person, right? And, and I wanna be very sensitive to what that experience is, but like I definitely, like that's some part of my emotional makeup is just like this kind of low lying, buzzing under the surface fear. And I'm like joking right now, but I also like some part of me is just like, I gotta run that way fast. Like if I, if I could get to Brooklyn before you guys can grab me, then hopefully We're not putting I'll your name on a list away. and we are not gonna bite. Appreciate How, it. However, uh, I think you're soft peddling a little bit if I can push you. Um, the role that Poxel, this kind of beloved uncle is playing for Eli, which is, you know, at one point he says something like, uh, he, uh, he carried on his broad shoulders the complicated burden of his own action in those days, and he had wrested his fate from the inevitable bearing down of history upon his fellow Ashkenazi Jews. And like, there's a, a bunch of moments like that in this book where it, like, this character, this one who's kind of contemporary, is kind of disgusted in a way by the, the broad mass of Ashkenazi Jews, and the reason that he loves Poxel, at least in my reading of it so much, is because he stood apart. You know, it, well, I mean, look, like that was. I also thought, in terms of the void Poxel fills, which is similar to what you're saying, but different, is that it had to do more with his masculinity and how he was defining masculinity as a younger. Guy Not that you're him, and but how his father him. is then contrasted. Well, well look, so, I, I would imagine like but. some of us in this room had the experience at some point in a Hebrew school on a Monday or Wednesday night of being like shown that film of the of the of the um, Warsaw Ghetto uprising, right? Like, there's a way in which like that is like a touchstone, right? Where you're just like, but they did hide grenades and they and they did fight back, and like, well, let's maybe not talk about what happened afterwards, but but there was this sort of moment of fighting back, and I guess what I would say to continue soft pedaling. Uh, I mean, so like here's this, my grandmother's first cousin who grew up in Light Maritz, and I don't know how much you know of like Czech geography. Uh, I wish Zero. I had a whiteboard, but like there's a, okay, so like if this is Prague, that's Light Maritz, and then like that's Tretzen. Uh So, so Light Maritz, which is the city where he grew up, which is about 60 kilometers north of um, Prague, literally three kilometers south was Tretzen. So, and Tretzen was the, the um, it wasn't a death camp, right? It was the camp where basically everybody in the Czech, in, in Czechoslovakia were brought to before they were deported to Auschwitz. People were killed there and hung there, but for the most part, it was where they would go before being deported. And so, like, he had played there when he was a kid. It was this 14th or 15th century fortress where he would just go down and play in this fortress, and then, like, that's where his parents were brought before they were then brought to Auschwitz. And so, I guess part of what I wanna say is, like, like, isn't there just some question of like, well, what was the experience of being able to sort of act before you couldn't act? Or if there was a period when you could act, like what did that look like if that's not the central story that we know from that period? I, th I mean, I think that was what your, is that inherently masculine? I don't know. I mean, no, but it just in terms of from Eli's point of view, it's what a thing, it's he's a thing he needs looking 15. for, right. and what his father, at least in the way I read it, did not carry for him. So I'm, I guess I'm looking at it more from an individual there's like a character a, point of view. There's but. a joke in the book at one point where he just sort of puts Poxel's memoir next to his X, his X Men comics. Right, exactly. And like it's like a joke and not a joke, right? Like there's like a character in the X Men named Nightcrawler who's a German blue guy who can time travel or whatever and who can teleport himself. But like that's the character, right? It's just like, well, what if, what if, I mean, like that's literally how that character was made by Stan Lee, right? Like what if there was like a German guy in 1941 who could just like poof himself out of the room and end up somewhere else? Or I mean, in a way that's what Cavalier and Clay is about, right? I mean, Michael Chabon was hitting on that question of just like, what if you could imagine your way out of this? But in a way, obviously it's to a different, a much different extent, but in the same way that I saw Eli, although this was kind of implicit and not explicit, wanting to escape the shadow of his kind of maybe not so masculine father and loving this, you know, adopted superhero uncle. You kind of see that with 
Franz, the son character in your book, who joins the brown shirts and is changes his name to von Stressing or whatever, you know, his mother's side of the family because he is literally disgusted by the sound of his father's last name, Perlmutter. You know, and it's interesting that you have that coming from a character who's in the brown shirts and you have that coming from a character, shades of it, who's living in 1986 in Boston. I mean, yes, he, there was during that time period um, in the late 20s a lot of very disturbing that I had to read racial theory and equating Jewishness with um, femininity and weakness. And so that was floating around in the culture and also, and so that was in part why I wanted Franz to, you know, at least in his mind, try to look for a different model of, you know, what his ideal masculine, which was also like anti-intellectual and, you know, all these other things that um, that movement stood for at that point. But there is some similarity there in terms of, you know, the models that they were looking for. Do you want to weigh in on Czechoslovakian geography? Uh, <laughs> on the map yeah, back yes. here again? Um, you know, if we could have the Jewish Book Council folks come around and collect questions for those of you who wrote them on cards, that would be great. If you could just raise your hand in the air, someone will come around and grab them. Um, and I will choose some lucky people. Um, last question for me, I think, uh, which is uh, another something that I pulled as I was reading both of your books, and, and I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on it. Um, I'm not going to ask you the, are you a Jewish writer? Are you a Jewy writer? Or are you a writer that's Jewish? No. But a version of that, uh, if you'll permit me. Um, it brought to mind this talk that uh, David Besmogus, who wrote a wonderful book called The Betrayers, you should all read it if you haven't read it. Um, in 2013, he gave this talk about the fate of American Jewish literature. And he said this, and I, I think it's provocative and interesting and, and I think very much related to these books, which is, uh, he said this, the Jewish future is to be found in Israel. The Jewish past is in Europe. Where in the equation is North America? neither the future nor the past, which begs the question, what kind of literature can be made of a place for Jews that represents neither the future nor the past? And I'm wondering what you guys make of that claim, because you've both chosen to write books about the, the past, I mean, kind of the settled past and, um, you know, kind of concluded periods of Jewish life. And I'm wondering uh, kind of where you see it heading, and, and if you think that Besmogus is right, that you know that's kind of dead, where we are is somewhere in between, and, and Israel is kind of the way to look for contemporary Jewish drama. Um, <laughs> I will punch. I know it's a light subject. <laughs> yeah, I will try my best to weigh in on this, but um, I'm not entirely sure that I would, I mean, Israel is in, in some ways the most dramatic, the most tumultuous right now in terms of Jewish identity and what is happening there and the art that is being produced there as a result of the conflict. And so I understand in looking at that, that it is the future or at least the very vibrant present. Um, but I do think that, I don't know, in some ways, the U.S. is very much the present as well in terms of all the different ways Jews define themselves here. Um, there's much, I, it seems to be more multiplicity. Um, and there is a big difference between being Israeli and Jewish and American Jewish. And maybe that tension is where this is heading. Yeah, I mean, I tend to think of questions of both or of not both of religion of ethnicity and um, in some ways questions of um, like belief in theology as being very personal and so uh, I love David Bismuskus I love his work uh, he and I have noted together that we seem to be the only two Jewish people ever to have written stories about weightlifters which is weird <laughs> um, and uh, like he read this story of mine called The Weightlifters, and he was like, we're the only people that have written about weightlifters. And I was just like, "That's we are the only Jewish weightlifters. Um, but there's some part of me that feels like I wouldn't want to try to make a claim of that size. And, and, um, and David is both better at writing and um, stronger than I am, so, so maybe he could make a big claim like that. For me, you know, we live in a 
culture that allows us to be a lot of things, and, and I wouldn't want to tell anybody how they should go about doing that. I know how I go about doing it, right? Which is, um, uh, like when I was asked a couple years ago to write about the new Jonathan Safran Foer, um, Nathan Englander Haggadah, uh, I wanted to, and I read it. And then I also went back and realized that it had been a long time <laughs> since I had read Exodus and also Genesis, and then also Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. And like, so I was just like, all right, I'm gonna give a month of my summer over to just like going back to the stone uh, Tanakh, and I read it, and I was really glad I did, and now I can make more jokes about Lot and his daughters than I could before. <laughs> um, but like, those stories are like very deeply embedded in me. Um, I'll give you one very brief and incredibly sidestepping anecdote, and then we can change the subject. Uh, a couple of years, I run this big reading series at Bryn Mawr where we bring lots of writers through, and about three or four years ago, in one year, I hosted uh, Jhumpa Lahiri, the American Indian writer, and then Ha Jin, the Chinese American writer, and both wonderful writers. It turns out that they were in the same workshop at the BU MFA program. Their workshop leader was Aaron Applefeld. <clears throat> he had come from Israel to teach the workshop, and in their workshop, all they read was Genesis. He said, if you want to learn how to tell a story, like Midrash, 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 that's all you're doing anyway. And you probably don't need more than this one book. And I guess all I would say is like, was that a Jewish activity for Hajin who, like Hajin's story is literally, he came on a Chinese grant to the United States to learn how to speak English to come back to communist China. And he was in a bar in Boston and saw Tiananmen Square on a screen looked around him with a little English, he said, and it was just like, what on earth is happening? And was deprogrammed essentially on the spot. And now he is a Chinese American writer. Um, Jim Palihiri has a, bit, a little bit of a different background. But I guess all I wanna say is like, like that's my Jewish American story that I would like to tell is just like, he, like, here are these stories, a lot of people read them, it's useful to read them. And then like wherever they go for you, culturally or theologically, like it's not really up to me to tell you. I kind of want to end on Genesis, but people ask good questions, so let me give them to you. Um, as writers who are also college writing professors, what are the lessons from your books that you teach your students, or you hope to teach your students? Um, I'll answer your question you. first for once. Uh, I had a really weird genesis in this book, which is that I, I had, um, there was a version of it that existed forever, um, and I think my agent is here now so she can laugh at me about this, but there was this version where it was just Poxel's narrative, and then there was another voice that opened it up with a prologue and an afterward, and it didn't work forever. And then I wrote a short story to try to get out of my system the thing that I wanted to do, and it became Eli's story. And about a year after doing that, I, and the book was not working, I realized like, oh, what if I made it into, what if I took the peanut butter and chocolate and made a Reese's peanut butter cup? So that is the Reese's peanut butter cup. So for me, like the thing that I wanna say to my students always is just like work on the sentences, work on the sentences, work on the ideas for as long as possible. Because I think often the thing that just makes it pop at the end, it happens in a minute for no reason with a bad metaphor, and then it's a book. And it's just not a book until then. I mean, my advice is a lot more simple in some ways, but it's just to communicate and not express yourself. <laughs> I mean, you obviously have to express yourself to communicate, but that the most important thing is communication and getting out of the bubble of your own head and not assuming that people know what you're trying to convey. Like it, okay. I wanna take your class. <laughs> that was good. Um, interesting, okay. Uh, do you have facility in the languages of the countries that you wrote about? And if you did not, uh, was this limiting in what you wanted to achieve? Let's start with Alexis. I did not, and that was a great source of anxiety. Um, I really felt that I needed to learn German to understand the characters better. But um, my husband speaks German and helped me with a lot of the words, so that worked out. I don't, I, you know, for, for the Czech Republic in particular, it, it was very complicated because, you know, that uh, during the war, people essentially mostly spoke German there, and then, and then now, like, all the street names that I was looking at are now in Czech, and so I had to do a fair amount of just sort of, like, interpolation of thinking about things, um, but yeah, no, I don't, I wish I did. Okay, last one. Um, did the experience of writing your books alter your understanding of yourself as a Jew? You 
Let's start with Daniel, since he's so comfortable with this uh, one. I mean, my, I feel like every morning I wake up and my kids alter my sense of myself as like a human. I, yeah, I, like, That's the cop out. I mean, I do, I do tend to have this sort of like phenomenological sense that it's just like I could wake up tomorrow as like a large dung beetle and hang out with Gregor Samsa. So, I mean, it's always changing and it changes day to day. And, um, I, you know, I was spending a lot of time trying to, um, uh-oh, so I, I spent a lot of time trying to interrogate some questions that I felt like I wanted to have answered, um, and I feel certain that I came out different. I don't think I could say in a pithy or quick way how or why. Um, yes, I think it did to a certain extent um, in thinking about Lev's high degree of assimilation, and I'm coming from a similar place and a similar family in some ways in terms of people not wanting to acknowledge their Jewishness and then suddenly acknowledging their Jewishness and just how malleable and changing Jewish identity is in the way that you want to express it and practice it. So it's definitely made me think more about that and having children too has brought it home and you know they go to a Jewish preschool and you know I always, I kind of think well I didn't really choose it necessarily because it's a Jewish preschool but they are at one and then I feel there's this connection and it's a stronger connection than if it wasn't a Jewish school so I do think that having children has just increased my identification with it okay just piggybacking on that uh, book recommendations of things that you guys have read, either for kids or adults, and then we'll close it with this. Uh, you know, my, my sort of like aesthetic lineage, that because I like to think a lot more about just sort of what books I read that made me think about the sentences that became this, as opposed to the um, topics. I feel like there's this through line for me from Isaac Bobble's short stories, especially the late stories, uh, to Leonard Michaels, and then to some contemporary writers like Amy Hempel, um, or George Saunders or Tobias Wolf. So for me, like, and, and, and Harold Brodke, who was a, a great uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s Jewish writer, who was at a time sort of like the, the most famous short story writer uh, in America. So those are sort of writers whose styles make me excited. Um, well, one of my early inspirations that I still go back to is uh, Joseph Roth, who um, wrote the Radetzky March, which is this epic generational novel as well about the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And I think I was always, had read that a long time ago, but had it in the back of my mind. And he wrote many other books and short stories that are wonderful, so I recommend him. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for listening.